Hello, everyone. I'm meteorologist Sean Sublett, and welcome to Across the Sky, our national Lee Enterprises weather podcast. Lee Enterprises has print and digital news operations in 77 locations across the country, including at my home base in Richmond, Virginia. I'm joined by my meteorologist colleagues across the country, Matt Holliner in Chicago, Kirsten Lang in Tulsa, and Joe Martucci in Atlantic City. Now this week, we are sharing part two of our special visit with Warren Madden, talking about his experience flying into hurricanes as part of the Air Force Reserve Hurricane Hunters. Before he retired as a lieutenant colonel in 2012, Warren flew into some of the strongest hurricanes on record. And in this week's episode, he talks about the lightning he saw while flying into Hurricane Rita at night in 2005. You mentioned a little bit earlier night flying, and I want to get into the specifics, if there's any, of the differences between flying during the day and at night. And we're saying thunderstorms. The one thing that came to my mind maybe is, you know, a lot of times with tropical cyclones, you have sometimes tornadoes with these. And is that a concern as well? Okay, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I, I did. Fortunately, I'm a night person, so I didn't mind the night flights that much. But there are some differences. Obviously, uh, your visual cues are not as uh, you know, not as usable. Uh, you know, one of the things back in back in the old days when I first started flying, uh, we we of course are not just interested in the winds at the level we're flying, but what's happening at the surface. So uh, we would use um, literally a picture book that would show different elements of, of, of wave patterns or sea foam or whatever as, as a reference guide to say, if you're looking down from 10,000 feet and you see these features on the surface, you, uh, you can estimate that the winds are this many knots. And it worked well enough for what it was, but of course you couldn't do it at night and you couldn't do it when you're in the clouds. We now have an instrument we've had in about 15 years now called the Stepped Frequency Microwave Radiometer which actually looks down and uses the microwaves bouncing off the surface, which are impacted by how much foam is being churned up. And through some very complicated math can actually come up with a pretty good estimate of surface wind speed. So we can use that now to let us see surface wind speeds even in, in the dark of night. And you know, with it being nighttime, when you get into the center of the eye, you don't have as, as, as good a visual presentation, but night missions can be beautiful in their own right. Uh, I remember uh, the first time I flew through a sub 900 storm, 900 millibars, was Hurricane Rita in 2005. And it was a very bumpy flight going in, not dog shaking, uh, but still pretty bumpy. And one of the interesting things about Rita was there was a lot of lightning in the storm. Uh, you know, hurricanes, uh, many hurricanes don't have a lot of lightning because the freezing level is so high. Uh, but when they're really getting going strong or, or rapidly strengthening or weakening, you can get a fair amount of lightning. So we're bumping through the eye wall in the middle of the night and there's lightning flashing all over the place. And then we break out into the eye. And in the new model of C-130 that we fly, the C-130J, the weather officer sits back in the cargo bay. So unfortunately, I don't have the view out the front window that I had in the earlier model of C-130J that I started in. So I'm back in the, in the cargo bay and the first words out of the pilot's mouth as we break into the eye of Hurricane Rita that first time were, holy expletive deleted. And so it's like, okay, what's going on? So eventually I did get a chance to come up and look. And what they were seeing was that the eye was normally, uh, the eye of a big hurricane is bowl shaped. And it looks kind of like, imagine that you're sitting on a, in a chair at the 50 yard line of a big football stadium and that all the stands going up around you, imagine those are thunderstorms, eight, 10 miles high. It is called the stadium effect for that reason. Hurricane Rita wasn't a stadium. It was a vertical pipe, 16 miles across, the eye was vertical. So we burst out into that, and now imagine that you've got lightning that would start off, say, off the left side of the aircraft and ripple across the front of the aircraft around the eye wall and finish, the bolt would finish off on the right side. That's what we were seeing. We were seeing lightning just continually flashing in the eye wall. So yeah, it wasn't in the day, but you wouldn't have seen that that impressively at night. And there have been times where I'll be in the middle of the eye and you've got a full moon shining over the rim of the eye wall down on you. In fact, the screensaver on my computer is a picture of one of those eyes where you've got Orion 
just kind of hanging right above the eye wall of a major hurricane. And then on the subject of tornadoes, yes, they, they can be a threat. And that's, again, one of the reasons that we have uh, in a standard C-130, the new C-130J, uh, the automation is such that they don't have a, a navigator as a standard crew member. But we specifically required that we keep our navigators because we rely on them so heavily to watch the radar, to make sure that we're not going into anything that we really you know, shouldn't be going into. And that's one of their responsibilities is to look for those kind of hook echoes or any kind of indication that there may be a, 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 a mesocyclone that we don't want to mess with. Uh, you know, people will ask, are the 130s that we bring into the storms, you know, modified in any way, strengthened or whatever? And I tell them, no, there's, there's no structural modification to beef them up. They're built tough that way, just standard. But one thing we did have to do when we switched to this new model C-130 is we had to work with the, the software people to reprogram the radar. The standard radar on a C-130J is a weather avoidance radar, you know, and so it's got the typical, you know, green, yellow, orange, red, you know, you don't go near red in a standard C-130. Well, our mission, we need a weather penetration radar. So our radar has about four different shades of red. You know, we, we go basically from red to magenta, to white, to flashing lights, white. So basically we go from, okay, that's bad, but you can go there to no bleepity bleep, bleep, bleep don't go there. So, so yeah, it's, uh, the night missions are, are fascinating on their, their own front. Uh, but I will admit, I will admit as a meteorologist uh, that I, I do wish I got to see more of those big daytime stadium effects because uh, I miss those with a lot of my night flights. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a quick question. This is going to shift gears just a little bit, um, but uh, I wanted to bring up this this year's hurricane season. And, uh, and you know, people have been talking, as Sean said earlier, just how uh, slow of its start it's kind of been, you know, since 2017. This is the first time we didn't see any named storms in June and July. Uh, what are your what's your take on this? Is it really putting us behind? And what do you project as we go into the next month or two ahead? Well, you know, it's not atypical to see a, a bit of a pause in the, the July, early August timeframe. You know, typically in the early part of the season, you'll get something they'll say spin up off the end of an uh, old cold front that's made its way down into the Gulf or off the East Coast or something. Uh, and, and so we, we do fly some early season storms. Now, we have seen, you know, in, in I think five of the last seven years, I think we've had May storms that we've flown which again, the season's supposed to start on one June, but uh, we do uh, can and do fly missions in May when we need to. Uh, but typically the peak of the season, the bulk of the season, if you look at the, the graph of, of storm activity over the, over the past 50, 100 years, the bulk of the season ranges from mid-August until you know, the late September, early October. So I know that NOAA just the other day, it might, might have only been yesterday, released their updated uh, tr uh, thinking on, on the, the season, and they're still calling for an above average season. You know, I think they're saying a 60% chance of an above average season. And it's been quiet recently due to a combination of factors. You know, the, the waters in, in the areas from Africa over to the Leeward and Wound Islands are still warming up. There's been a lot of Saharan, uh, Saharan uh, air layer uh, and dust that helps to suppress convection. Uh, but eventually that's going to give way and we're going to, I think, enter the, the more active phase of the season. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we've been through two of the most active seasons on record in 20 and 21. And uh, I could use a quiet season, but I'm, I don't know if I'm going to get get one here. Uh, you know, we we uh, my office is only a three person office, and so when we go into storm operations, we go twenty four seven. One of us is on the day shift, one's on the swing, and one's on the overnight. And especially if we get a long lasting storm, or if storms go back to back to back, we can be working 10, 14, 18 days straight. Uh, you know, that's just part of the part of the mission. And uh, so I'm, while I think that it seems likely that our current quiet period won't last forever, uh, that we will be dealing with, with, with our own set of storms this year, uh, I'm hoping it isn't too bad. I'm hoping that a lot of them just stay out in the ocean. You know, people always ask me, is it going to be a busy hurricane season? And I always respond to them saying, it's all going to depend upon where the storms are. We could have a lot of storms, but if they stay away from land, 
it, it certainly would impact maritime operations, but fortunately wouldn't impact a lot of people. But you could have a, a, a small number of storms in terms of the averages. But if that one big storm of the year, you know, hits a major area, you know, that that's that's news. Like 1992, overall, it was a relatively quiet year in terms of number of storms, except for one, Andrew. So, you know, we always have to be ready. That's the thing. People always need to be ready. Be looking at your hurricane kit. Use this quiet period to be stocking up on your hurricane kit if you're in vulnerable areas, looking for what your evacuation routes are, where you're going to go, whether your pets can go there. A lot of evacuation centers won't take pets. And, you know, they're like our kids. Uh, you know, we don't want to leave them behind. And so use the quiet period to be prepared because the, the time to be getting prepared is not when the hurricane is 72 hours out from landfall. Learning to swim is a magical time in a child's life. The excitement of the water, playing with friends, making memories on vacations that will last a lifetime. British Swim School has locations throughout the U.S. where we specialize in teaching anyone to swim, from babies to adults, beginners to those who need a refresher pre-summer. British Swim School's instructors make learning to swim fun with gentle teaching methods. Sign up your kids for swim lessons at BritishSwimSchool.com. Yeah, so Warren, back back to that thought a minute. Um, how far you, you have to go out to make contact with the hurricane, if you will, to, to actually do the to the research or, or take the observations. Uh, is that kind of your role now? Are you are you kind of involved in, in deciding what hurricanes are, are worthy or tropical systems are worthy of going out to do recon on, or or is your your job nowadays a little more logistical? I would say it's more of a court, uh, you know, the name of the, the name my, my unit is, you know, coordination, has coordination right in the name. So what we do every day during hurricane season from 1 June to 30 November, every morning, myself or one of my teammates will go across the hall to talk to the forecasters and say, what are your reconnaissance needs? And we're always working a day in advance. So like, for example, today, I asked them, what flights would you need tomorrow? And on hopefully most days, they're going to say, we're good. In which case we go back and we tell the squadrons that. And then uh, the squadrons are going to continue running training missions. They don't just sit there. They're always running training missions because we're uh, such a unique field. We're our own schoolhouse. There are some things that you, you have to just rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And then also things that you can only learn inside the storm. So we're always training. And so we support those training missions, you know, taking the information in from them and getting it out to the world and such. But now let's say there is something. So my job as Parka is to go and talk to the forecasters and determine what they need in terms of flights. So they might say, OK, uh, we're going to need a, a zero and six Z flight and another flight for 12 and 18 Z. And then that'll be the heart. That'll be the 53rd. And then the P3 is going to do a, uh, a mission using the tail Doppler radar that'll be for 18Z tomorrow as well. And then we're going to need the G4 to fly a mission starting at 18Z tomorrow to go and fly, uh, you know, a track around the storm and out to the northwest of the storm to help figure out what's happening in the atmosphere. So they give us the requirements saying this is what we need you to fly. And then my office's job is to play what we term five dimensional aircraft chess because the forecasters, you know, they want as much recon as possible. We have limited assets. And so we have to work with the forecasters and, and the squadrons to match capabilities to requirements. And then every day, based upon that work, we put out what's called the plan of the day or the pod. And that is a publicly available product. If, if viewers or listeners rather want to go to the National Hurricane Center, they can see what is planned for the next day's recon each day. Uh, and that's the product that my office puts out. So then once that's done, then the next day comes and we're executing those missions. So part of our job there is, again, we're going to the forecasters, getting updated coordinates and, and wind speeds and strengths and, and what they're looking for in terms of the mission profile. And then we'll communicate that to the weather officers. So they know what they're expecting. And then as the planes fly the missions and collect the data, they're sending it all via satellite communication links back into my office. 
And we're doing quality control on it to make sure it makes sense with the broader meteorological picture and then providing it to the forecasters so they can incorporate that into their forecasting thinking. And then also going out into the computer wires to be ingested into the models. And of course, also available to the, uh, to the news media. So you can see like when a, uh, you know, they pass through the center of the storm, you can read off what's called the vortex data message, which says, this is what we see on this current pass. And, uh, you know, I know on the weather channel, we had a printer that would automatically print those out and so I would, you know, grab that and take it out and be bringing the latest information on the location and strength to the viewers. And so, you know, all of the information we gather is publicly available for use for, you know, not just for the forecasters themselves, but for the media and for the general public. Hey, Warren, it's Matt again. So I have a quick two part question, but I promise the second part is, is going to be real quick. I think the first part that I want to ask you is if people are listening to this and they're getting real excited. And they're like, man, I want to be a hurricane hunter so bad. This sounds exactly what I want to do. What do people need to do if there's a job posting to be with the hurricane hunters at 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron? What do people need to have to be hired and accepted into that position? And the quick second part is, what is the age where you can no longer fly into the storms? What is that age that you mentioned that you hit where you can no longer <laughs> go into the storms? That way well, people can't we can limit the number of applicants for the job because some people won't be able to be even apply to the job <laughs> over right. a certain age. <laughs> so um, the, the 53rd Weather Recon is, of course, an Air Force Reserve unit. So uh, in order to uh, join the unit, you would have to, you know, become a part of the Air Force Reserves, which would include, uh, you know, the usual training and such. Uh, and then uh, in terms of joining the unit, you know, we do have postings that would go out on USA jobs. And it, it, it's not to say that you already have to be in necessarily in order to join, but you'd have to, you know, as part of that uh, process, you would have to uh, come on board and then that you end up going to basic training, whatever, and depending upon whether you're applying to be, you know, a pilot or a weather officer or you know, that those are a navigator, those are of course officer billets. And so uh, you'd have to, you know, meet those requirements. And then the load masters are enlisted uh, and they have a different set of requirements. And uh, then, of course, there's going to be a fair amount of flight training. Uh, obviously, if you're a private pilot already, or if you're, you're listening and you're an airline pilot looking to pick up some extra money uh, and be involved in a really cool mission flying stuff that you'd never go close to in an in a Airbus 320 or a, a Boeing 737, you know, that certainly helps. Although we have also had times where people have joined and then gone off to pilot training. Uh, as far as the max age, and then also I, I should say that our unit is split in terms of how we're manned. Uh, half of the squadron are called Air Reserve Technicians, and they are U.S. Air Force Reservists, but they also are government employees, civil service employees, and they run the squadron on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the other half of the squadron are what are called traditional reservists, and that's what I was. And they're your prototypical, you know, weekend a month, two weeks a year thing. But I will say that being in a flying squadron, especially like the Hurricane Hunters, that you're not going to just do a weekend a month, two weeks here. You're going to have to put more into it to maintain currency and uh, keep up on all the training because, of course, you want to never fall behind in the training when you're spending time out in the storm. You want to make sure you're as ready as possible. And then as far as the maximum age, uh, you know, the the way the reserves work is that you uh, you you peak out at a certain age in terms of it's not so much age as years of service. So like for, for me, I the highest authorized billet in the Hurricane Hunters squadron is a lieutenant colonel. And I was fortunate enough to get to lieutenant colonel, but with lieutenant colonel, you can only go to 28 years of service before they say, okay, it's time to move on. Now, certainly I could have tried to have made full colonel, but unfortunately that would have meant I would have had to find a job in another location because there aren't any colonel slots in the squadron. And I decided, no, you know, this is a good capstone to my career. I really don't want to go any further than this. So now, now I'm on the civilian side. We're just the three civilian jobs here at the the uh, Karka unit are the uh, the ones that are not military, but all three of us have some experience with flying in one shape or another. Well, that's good to know. But there's still hope for uh, some of the older folks out there who want to get into some of the hurricane action. <laughs> it's not necessarily a, a you're not you're not going to be kicked out just because you're a certain age. It's the number of years that you've been in. Right, right. But there, of course, are age limits to when you can actually join the reserves. Uh, you know, because they want to make sure that you have enough years 
of you know potential service that it's uh, you know it's it's worthwhile for them as well. So, but I mean, hey, I've I I ended up spending eight years active duty and then switched right over into the reserves and then served another you know nineteen and a half. And I certainly didn't think I was going to do that when I you know when I started the whole thing. I thought I was going to do my four years at MIT and then pay back my four years uh, uh, of the ROTC scholarship and go over to the civilian sector. But in the end, I decided that it was, you know, I, I really felt like, you know, like I was doing an important thing and, and serving the country and, you know, help, especially in the hurricane hunter role, protecting lives and property directly. And uh, that there's a lot of satisfaction. in that. Hey, Warren, Joe again. So like you said, you have been doing this for a long time. And, uh, you know, with all the data and, you know, technology that you have, I have to imagine internet is quite important. And I'm wondering how internet connectivity has related to your job from when you started in the 90s to, I don't even know if there was any kind of wireless then, but to now where there's wireless everywhere. Interesting. Yeah, it, it definitely has been an ongoing process as technology. I mean, the meteorology has always been very much involved with computers, no doubt about it. Uh, but now with the connectivity coming on more and more, uh, you know, that has definitely impacted how we both get data and how we consume data. Uh, you know, we, uh, on, on the aircraft, uh, our P3s have effectively uh, internet on the plane and the G4, the NOAA aircraft. Um, with the WCs, we're still working on getting a full up internet connection because there's different military requirements and the like that the NOAA aircraft don't have to deal with because they're civilian. Uh, so as we get better bandwidth, we're able to, of course, bring down more data from the aircraft. Right now on the, on the uh, P3s, you know, on all aircraft, we're getting the text data that, uh, that we use, uh, you know, the typical uh, Vortex data message and some of the high density observations. With the NOAA aircraft, uh, they actually have a tail Doppler radar on board the P3s and they have enough bandwidth capability so they can be sending imagery back that is available to the forecasters that show sort of a, a vertical 3D perspective of, of the storm as they're flying through. And then once we're, we're getting close to getting a similar uh, bandwidth on the Air, Air Force aircraft, and once we do that, we'll be able to get more radar imagery from them and also other kinds of uh, data that require more bandwidth than, than what we're currently available. So that's how we're getting the data from the aircraft. And then it used to be that we would get the data to the forecasters and to the media, and that would be pretty much how it would end up disseminating out to the rest of the world. But now there are a lot of excellent websites that uh, you can go to that are looking at that raw data feed that are, we're sending out from the planes and are doing their own analyses on it. You can find sites that will show you the plots of the aircraft as they're flying through. Uh, they'll show you the, uh, the vertical profiles from all of the, the drop sons, the instrument packages we're releasing. And uh, there's, you know, in terms of the computer models, uh, you know, you, there are websites out there where you can see all of the computer models as they're coming in to kind of see what the, uh, what the storm, the, they think the storm's going to do. Now, of course, that's kind of a mixed blessing because on the one hand, there's more information of it. But on the other hand, there's not necessarily, unless you, you're, knowledgeable and trained on how to interpret that imp information, it can lead to cases where people are perhaps not taking actions that they need to because they're not seeing information. They're, they're, they're seeing information that say, let's say that there's a storm that the forecasters are saying is heading right to an area. And yet the computer models, there's a bigger spread on it. It could be easy for a uh, somebody looking at the, the raw computer model saying, well, it's not for sure it's coming here, so I don't need to evacuate yet. Whereas, you know, the forecasters, one of the, and I have such enormous respect for the forecasters that we work with here. I mean, they're some of the smartest minds in the world in the area of tropical meteorology. And I, they're, they're putting out their forecast, they're looking at just countless pieces of data. And every few hours they're having to, coalesce that and decide which stuff to you know say is work is working well which is not following things really well you know what to discard what to focus on and come up with a unified forecast say here's what we think is going to happen and the flip side of more access to raw data out in in the world thanks to the internet is that 
it could lead to people not paying as much attention to the forecasters. And that's a dangerous thing because, you know, you, you don't want people to think, oh, we don't have to worry about that one. Uh, because I saw this random person saying, oh, it's headed over here when the forecasters are saying, no, it's headed over here and you're there. So, you know, kind of, lots of power, but with great power, as Uncle Ben said, comes great responsibility. Kirsten, did you want to follow up? I'm good. I'm just, I'm listening and taking time. <laughs> I don't really have anything off the top of my head right now. But. No, it's fine. It's fine that uh, there's so, so much good stuff uh, out of all of this. We're going to break it into two because it's that good. <laughs> or just have me back for another episode. <laughs> we talked a little bit about some of the more memorable ones with Rita in particular. You were over, the, that one was over the Gulf, right? Yeah, that was 2005 over the Gulf. And I made, I'm not sure with, with we used to have squadrons that also flew in the Western Pacific. And that with budget cuts and stuff kind of went out back in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't get to the Western Pacific that often. I was fortunate enough, there was a research project that happened in 2010 that requested hurricane hunter support. So we actually flew some planes out of Guam for a couple of months in 2010. And I was out there and got to fly into Super Typhoon Meggie uh, as it was heading toward the Philippines. So I'm probably one of the few people who's actually gotten into sub 900 millibar storms in both hemispheres. For those who don't know what that means, sub 900, that means that the central pressure was less than 900 millibars. And these are the biggest of the big, the baddest of the bad. I mean, there's, well, how many of those have there even been? Maybe a dozen, 15 globally? Uh, I'm not years? sure. Pro I mean, Ballpark. one of the unfortunate things about losing recon in the Western Pacific is of course now, we don't have direct measurements yeah. of some of those big storms to know. But in the Atlantic, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but I, I would say you're probably right. And somewhere in the range between 10 and 20 overall, since measurements have been taken, uh, have, been, have been gotten to that level. Yeah, they're, they're not common and they are absolute beasts. That's for sure. Uh, Warren, I want to uh, wind things down. We appreciate all the all the time you spent with us, and you bet we can have you on again when when it starts to get bad. If there's anything else, because uh, there's lots of great stories that you could share, and, and very much, uh, very much appreciated. So, real quick, as we, as we uh, wrap up, is there any place that people can can find you on social media, or is it just kind of good to follow the Hurricane Center? I would say, I mean, I don't. I'm on social media. I don't post all that much. And plus, which being a government employee, you know, there's yeah. always that thing as well. But I would say, you know, the the hurricane hunters, uh, both both the NOAA and Air Force hurricane hunters have active Twitter accounts and, and Facebook accounts that are always good to follow. They, they post some excellent pictures uh, and videos uh, of their their travails. And the Hurricane Center is very active on social media. I'm sure some of your listeners have uh, watched uh, over the past couple of years our, our now former director, unfortunately, but fortunately for us, he's now higher up. Uh, Ken Graham is now the head of the entire weather service, and he was a master at, at giving uh, briefings on Facebook about uh, incoming tropical systems. And so he left some very big shoes to fill for uh, whoever's uh, stepping in after him to do that. But that's an excellent way to get information and, uh, you know, so there's lots of good social media out there from uh, from the National Weather Service and from both the Air Force and NOAA Hurricane Hunters uh, for you to follow to find out what's going on. And again, if you want to find out what's flying uh, at the Hurricane Center site, there's an aircraft reconnaissance uh, section that you can look at to see what is for forecast and what we're planning on flying in the next day as storms get active. Yeah, I would imagine you could just Google um, National Hurricane Center plan of the day, tropical prediction center, plan of the day, hurricane hunters, plan of the day, and, and yeah, that'll come, come right up uh, pretty fast. Uh, great. Warren, thanks so much. Have a My pleasure. A, yes, sir. Have a, a good, safe season. Uh, we'll let you go, but we're going to come right back with some closing thoughts here on the Across the Sky podcast. This week, we also want to introduce a new feature to the podcast, we are delighted to have NASA Ambassador Tony Rice start sharing his weekly astronomy report with us. Tony works at the famous Research Triangle Park in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina and shares really cool astronomy nuggets on his Twitter handle, RTP Hokey, as he is also a 1992 graduate of Virginia Tech. So for this week, you may have heard some news reports about the Earth's rotation slowing down. 
In his first report with us, Tony talks about why that is and who needs to worry about it. Looking beyond the atmosphere, here's Tony Rice with your Astronomy Outlook. We all learned in school that the Earth rotates once each 24 hours, right? Not exactly. In the 50 years that we've been closely monitoring the Earth's rotation, that's really only happened once. July 19th, 2008. It was a Saturday, I think. Earth's rotational period varies for a number of reasons. Earth's mass is redistributed by seasonal changes in polar and sea ice, monthly by the changing distance to the moon, and even daily by changes in the jet stream. But overall, the Earth has been slowing. This is in large part because of gravitational forces between the Earth and moon. They tug on each other, creating a tidal force, which pushes the moon further away by about four centimeters a year, or about the speed your fingernails grow. Like a spinning figure skater extending their arms, this slows rotation. Since 1972, the US Naval Observatory has been charged with monitoring that length of day. They issue weekly reports, including a 365 day forecast, but the product that comes out each January and June is of particular interest to the tech sector. It gives six month warning when the addition of a leap second is necessary. These leap seconds are needed as the milliseconds add up for the very regular atomic clocks to catch up with the not so regular days measured by Earth's rotation, known to astronomers as a solar day. But something interesting has been happening over the past two decades. The length of day is now trending shorter. Short day records fell several times in 2020, and the shortest day in recorded history occurred just this past June 29th. But why the shift? We're not really sure, but there are a few theories. Recent large earthquakes have been shown to redistribute enough mass in the Earth to impact rotation. Another theory points to melting glaciers and polar ice caps. This adds water to the oceans and changes circulation, but it also increases pressure on the ocean floor, which in theory brings it closer to the axis of rotation. Remember our figure skater from before. But the most intriguing theory is movement of the geographic poles, known as the Chandler Wobble. This is named for an American astronomer who first described it in 1891. Think of a spinning top. Now think of what happens to the speed of that top as it begins to wobble. So why do we care? If the recent trend of shorter days continues, there's concern that a negative leap second might be needed. And we're not really sure how our highly networked technology world might handle that. Previous leap second additions have crashed websites and caused airline delays. But this is also worth keeping an eye on by the weather enterprise, if just from a science communication point of view. Because if you stand back and look at those trends over decades and longer versus the day-to-day -day ebb and flow of the length of day, it looks a lot like the climate versus weather discussion. That's your Astronomy Outlook. Follow me on Twitter at RTP Hokey for more spacey stuff like this. And welcome back to the Across the Sky podcast, wrapping up our two-part podcast with Warren Madden from the Hurricane Hunters with all those amazing stories about flying through eye walls and, and nighttime lightning and, and all of that stuff. Just a fascinating, fascinating career, guys. Yeah, he's uh, and he's been doing it for for a long time and a lot of stories. I think uh, I think we are going to have to have him back for some kind of part three here. But, you know, he um, he really knows how to tell a, a great story. And when it comes to hurricane hunting and all the data and equipment and names and everything can get a little over your head sometimes. So I, I just think more than anything, he did a great job of telling the story of what a hurricane hunter does. And then also explain some of the interest intricacies there we go, uh, along with it as well. Yeah, I could listen to him talk and tell more stories for several more hours. That was just great stuff. And I, I just loved how he put that that personal touch on it, you know, just <laughs> describing what it's like when you're feeling that most intense turbulence. You're just being shaken around <laughs> like a dog toy. It's like that is a visual for you. Everybody has seen that. And it's like. I, I, you know, that's where I, I draw the line. You know, they, they have the options, you know, for people in the media. I mean, not right now with the COVID situation, but, you know, for people in the media to go up. And I don't know, I'm still kind of on the edge. I feel like it would be such an amazing experience and I would remember it for the rest of my life. But man, when he talks about just getting shaken around like that and your eyeballs bouncing around in your head, it's like, 
Man, I don't know. I would get, I'd be real nervous. I would be real, real nervous. <laughs> I would be second guessing my decision. I agree with you, Matt. The, uh, the frog hopper at the amusement park is enough for me on a good day. So I don't know about the plane on a, uh, on just take some dramamine, sport. you know, that's I'm sitting here. And I'm thinking <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was very against ever being on something like that. I'm like, I can't do it. I can't even get on a commercial pl- airplane without feeling sick while we're landing. But I don't know. He almost swayed me the opposite way. Now I'm sitting here kind of like Sean thinking, hey, can I get my name on that list? Like that just sounds fun. I think you did say there were times when it's not that bad. Right. It's like, oh, it's no worse than yeah. being a regular flight and regular train. It was, you know, I never thought about it. It's like, yeah, a lot of people have flown through category five hurricanes. They just never know it when they're up in the jet stream. Yep. It's like, oh, never thought about that. Huh. Just take some joy with me. <laughs> it's, I would still do it. I mean, look, I, I can't, look, I can't even ride roller coasters the way I used to 25 years ago. But this is one of those things that as a meteorologist, if you had the chance to do it, you almost ought to do it because it, it gives you that personal experience of, of really understanding what the atmosphere is doing up there, 5, 10, 15,000 feet up. I mean, we all... We all kind of know what it looks like. You know, we, we've seen enough pictures. We've done enough studying. So we know it. But when you experience it firsthand, it it, it really changes the dynamic. Sounds like you're, you're pressuring us, Sean. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think being in the eye wall would be worth it. Seeing that stadium effect or mm-hmm. the way he described it at night, the lightning going around the eye wall. I bet that was just incredible to see. I, I think that might be the payoff. You know, the really bumpy ride in and out would be worth it just to say, wow, I'm actually in the eye of a hurricane right now. I mean, that would just be an unforgettable experience. I can't imagine. And then to see, see the stars. I mean, you can see the constellations while you're in this in the eye of a hurricane, 10,000 feet up, you're in the stadium effect, lightning going around, you look up, there are constellations. Amazing, for sure. I would totally love all right, Lee Enterprises goes in a hurricane hunter. There oh yeah, and and believe me, can, as that we can easily get, we can easily sell that story to the boss, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> we can record a podcast on the plane. That's oh my gosh, can you even can you imagine? Might even, be a little loud, a lot of background noise. Really loud. I think they'd buy it if we got a sponsor for it. We just, we just <laughs> always, always. All right, everybody. Um, so we're going to wrap that up. We appreciate again Warren joining us for uh, for the Hurricane Hunters two parts podcast everybody stay safe we will talk to you next week from the uh from the podcast for for joe and matt and and kirsten uh thanks everybody for listening we'll see you next time on across the sky